TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, oh, this page, you ask, what's this? Uh, man, this is where we put all the live stuff. So when I go on YouTube live or I go on Twitch live, and you may have missed some of the reactions that be on there, they're here. If they're not already uploaded on the main channel, they're here. Um, and these shorts are the little stories that be in between sometimes. Uh, funny stuff, man. Funny stuff, man. This link to this is down in the description, man. So first responders, if you're in here or anybody that's in here, man, go hit that. Go, like, go, go, go. You know what I'm saying? And don't forget, this page is not ran by me. It's ran by, uh, well, it's, my, of course, it's ran by me. But, like, I don't upload. I don't make any of this stuff. It's, it's somebody else is doing this. From the UK, so support the people. <laughs> uh, don't forget, we do got the Patreon. The link to this is down in the description. And let's get to this, man. This is part two. I'm only doing part two because I did part one. So 34 years on death row in prison. This is part two to that one. And don't forget, we got the Discord as well. Link down in the description. I'm more famous than Jesus Christ. Oh, this is a recap. Man, yeah, yeah. This story was crazy. If y'all ain't watching, this up here somewhere. Oh, wait. Dang, I didn't want to do that. Uh, let me move this because I was going to read it, but... Nah. What the heck is going on? Why is it... This the chat? Why is the chat down here? Okay. Anyway. This is a recap. Uh, he took a plea deal to save his wife, and his wife was sentenced to on a, and his wife was sentenced to murder charges. Um, he was served thirty four years in prison for a murder which he denies to this day. Hold on, no, 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 that's not the full story. The wife he took the plea deal for left him for another man that she had met. Now, now that's important to what's going on. I don't know why they didn't tell us that. But she took a plea deal for his wife, and while she was in a holding cell in prison with other prisoners, she met a girl, and she, the girl put her on to her, her brother, and she left this man that took a plea deal for him as soon as she was free for her brother. Crazy. That's the craziest part. <laughs> All right, now we can go. We arrived there on a gray, a gray school bus type thing, modified school bus called the Grey Goose. <clears throat> and the Folsom looks like a castle and has a <clears throat> big turret right there at the front gate. And it's, uh, it's got a big stone uh, gateway coming in and big iron gates that slam behind you and just reverberate through the bus. You know, and uh, it really does, they tell you it's the end of the line. And it really does feel like that. You can, you can feel the misery in the place. You can feel... Um, the hate in the place. You can feel all these different emotions and uh, none of them are joy and happiness. Those don't come into play. We come off the bus. The bus drops us off, backs up and goes out. We're standing there in line at the receiving and re, uh, leasing unit. And we have a sergeant. He's walking out in front there and he says, uh, My bad. I want to welcome you all to Folsom State Prison. It's the second oldest prison. It was built in 1880. And he's talking, and he's giving us this entry welcome spiel. One of the people that had come up with us was uh, a very young kid, uh, real long hair and stuff. And while he was at Vacaville, which had a, a very large um, gay population, State what they would call B-cat bees, which were the effeminates. And he's got painted nails and you know, makeup on, and he's standing between. Infeminates, I never heard that. Me and this other guy. And as the sergeant's walking back and forth, suddenly the gate behind him, uh, coming out of five building, slams open, and out comes running this little Mexican guy running for his life. And just seconds behind him is this great big Mexican guy with a big old knife in his hand, about an 18-inch blade. And the small guy 
turns and looks at us for a moment and runs into the corner of the yard fence, bounces off, and the big guy gets there and stabs him up. Now, we have gunners on the yard. They have shotguns and they have pistols. None of them were able to react fast enough to stop that guy from stabbing this kid up. But he stabs him up, throws the knife down, and waits, and all these guards run out and guff him up. And uh, the sergeant, without breaking a stride, goes, and as you notice here at Folsom State Prison, we have unscheduled extracurriculum activities happening at any given moment. And the sergeant goes, you two, pick your girlfriend up and bring her inside. You could have three stabbings during your yard time before they'd finally close the yards and make you go back to cells. Because they would just... Three. <laughs> Sorry, that ain't funny. One stabbing ain't enough. You need three to close up? Shut the yard. They'd put everybody on the ground, come out, pick up the body, take the body away, and resume yard. But after the third time, they go, that's enough. Okay, everybody go back to your cells. Play time's over. Violence was such a, a, a normal thing that you... If it didn't happen for a period of time, you started getting nervous because that meant something was brewing. Uh, <clears throat> but you'd have uh, you'd be trying to eat chow, and we had metal serving trays where our food came on. And uh, at that time, they gave you metal forks and metal spoons, which of course people turned into stabbing instruments. But what would they do with the trays? They'd sharpen the tray on the concrete floor, and then they'd fling it across the room, and it would hit you, the, and it could peel a, pal- a person's scalp right off their head. Um, weight piles, you go out to the weight pile, you better be really cautious about who you're working around and working out with because nobody would think something about picking a 40 pound dumbbell up and smashing your skull with it or smashing your kneecaps with it. I was there about nine months before I got transferred to San Quentin. And uh, funny enough, one of the people- You went from bad prison to worse to worse. The California prison which holds the state's death row prison. That was there that I knew. I had known when I was a kid on the streets. And his name was Doug Stankowitz. And I knew him. I knew him and his family. They were Mono Indians. I knew his brother, Johnny. In 1972 and 1976, the California Supreme Courts threw out the death penalty. When they reinstated it in 77, the very first person to go back to death, go to death row was Doug Stankowitz. You know, it's one of these things where you're on the upper yard and they bring somebody out death row to take somewhere to medical or something. And they yell, everybody face the wall, dead man walking. And you hear the guard saying this. And I always wondered how'd that make the guy they're walking feel because I knew every time I'd hear it, I shuddered because you know, you're telling the guy, you know, you're a dead man. But with California, unlike Florida and Texas, if you get the death penalty, you're far more likely to die of old age, you know, than you are to be put to death. Because Doug- Hey Siri. Uh-huh. Does Florida have the death penalty? Okay. Wow. The death penalty information center, the US Supreme Court has ruled Florida's death penalty. Practice unconstitutional no numerous times. Yes, they do. Wow. Better stay out of trouble out here, man. Doug Stankwitz is still alive today, even though they have put people to death. Did you get into any like physical altercations in jail? And what, what would they kind of be about and over? Well, at Folsom, when I first went there, I got into a beef with the Aryan Brotherhood. They... They always say that they did. No, they formed is. up to protect whites from the blacks and the Hispanics. But what I saw was that they generally victimized the whites, you know. And, uh, but it all came down to power, drugs, you know. And because I didn't want to be a part of their thing, uh, they didn't appreciate the fact that I told them, yeah, I don't need you. Initially, I was called in to go into the, the boxing ring because the idea was if you went into a fight ring, the guards would not, you wouldn't get written up no matter what happened in the ring. The first guy they sent against me was a much larger man than me. The problem was he underestimated me and uh, I ended up putting him down. And then that made it even worse because now they're like, women, women, you know, now we need to know about him. And it became that kind of thing. And, uh, but it wasn't until I actually got to San Quentin that uh, they had sent guys to try to stab me up 
But I got word. I had taped up National Geographic magazines around my arms and, and uh, had telephone books made into a stab vest under my jacket. And, but even at that, <clears throat> one of the guys had a knife big enough and strong enough that even when he did, it still went through, through the magazines and stabbed me about an inch into my arm. I got this. Dang. One of them got slashed across the face by one of the other guy's knives trying to get me, you know. And I ended up breaking one of their arms. And, was, and we ended up getting this altercation over with. And I was able to get away without being caught. They had injuries, so they, of course, got taken to medical. But the thing is, they can't tell, because to tell means that they're going to get, you know, PC'd up, you know, protective custody, because you, can't, you don't tell. My thing was is that I'm not going to slap fight with you. You're trying to come over here and cause me a problem. I'm going to try to hurt you. And I'm going to try to make sure you know you got hurt so you won't want to come back again. And that's the way it worked out. Well, that's how jail is. <laughs> Eat or be ate. Especially when they on you already. You got to hey, set that example is what I'm hearing is from him. Most of the prisons I was at, with the exception of a couple, very few couple, uh, there were stabbings all the time. Even at DVI, there were cell killings. Two guys be... Dual vocational institution. In a cell, one guy got mad, the other guy, prison. kill him. Then, then go to breakfast, come back and tell the cop, hey, you got to get that body out of my cell, it's stinking. And that's the first time the cop knows there's somebody dead in that cell. Jamie was, a prison, was in prison with infamous American criminal, including Charles Manson, leader of the Manson family cult, who led members of the cult to nine people. Oh. He was also in prison with a serial killer. Dang, come on now. How who? He was also in, a, in prison with the serial killer Ed Kepner, who murdered 10 people, including his own. Wow. Oh, y'all could have read that yourself. My bad. I wouldn't even. To be him. honest, like Ed Kemper, and I, I don't know, uh, a lot of people know who he is. When I first saw him walk into the room, he was, he was given as part of our orientation the second day I was in prison. He's, he was like six foot six, six foot seven, 300 pounds. And he walked in the room, and the first, my first thought was, like, if I ever had to fight this man, I'd have to try to kill him because, I mean, this guy would, could, this guy was just, you know, he he has that kind of weird, ominous presence that he's a danger just in his way walking in. Six, seven, three hundred pounds, yo. And he spoke to us in a very monotone thing, and one of the things that got me was when he was talking to us. I think I seen a, a a movie that had him in there for like not a movie like a TV show or something. It was called Inside Man, that TV show on Netflix. I think that's what it's called. He goes, "Every man must have a moral compass. You must not deviate from your moral compass." And I'm looking at the guy going, "And you did what? You know, I mean, you know, where's the moral compass here?" Um, but luckily. With my situation with him, I only had a couple of minor dealings with him there. And then when I went to work in the hospital, uh, he came in one time and I had to get him into a room to be, <laughs> to be seen. And uh, He worked in a prison hospital as a nursing assistant in lab tech. Having to go, uh, would you come here with me and, uh, and go over there and sit down over there and having him just stare at me with this like deadpan eyes, you know. It was like he wasn't, and he didn't engage me verbally. He just looked at me, you know. I was like, oh, crying, you know. But Charlie Manson, a whole different char character. I was there about a week, and a guy goes, hey, you want to meet Charlie Manson? No. Like, Charlie Manson. He goes, yeah, he's here. He works as a gardener in the Catholic Chapel Garden. So he took me over to see him, and I saw him from the door. I didn't go actually go in and meet him at that moment. And quite honestly, I was disappointed. And here's this little tiny man, <laughs> beard, hair, just, and I kept thinking the way everybody talked about Charlie, he would be a larger man, and he wasn't. But my first uh, actual interaction with him, he was at the canteen line, and he had rocks that he had painted. And he goes, you want to buy one of my rocks? No, nah, I don't want to buy one of your rocks. What, you don't want to buy one of my rocks? And he goes, don't you know who I am? I'm Charles Manson. I'm more famous than Jesus Christ. And I'm like, yeah, okay. 
And I just ignored him, right? And again, it's one of those things where he was used to being somebody that people don't ignore. Well, I'm working in the clinic and one of the things they would do is always trying to get needles, you know, and any drugs they could steal from the clinic. Well, a lot of times they would go and they'd pressure the young guys who were working there to steal the stuff. One day he came in and he goes, look, here's a list of stuff I need. And I go, sorry about your luck. Mm. He goes, no, you don't understand. I want this stuff. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. And he's like, you, you've got to learn how, how to play this. I, no, I don't. And so he, he gets real frustrated. And all of a sudden, he just starts screaming at the top of his lungs. And he's jumping up on chairs and jumping off chairs. And all this, his staff's running towards him. And I see some of his other friends come running in. They hit one of the med cabinets real quick and grab a bunch of stuff and run back out. Quite honestly, having known Tex Watson and having met Charlie Manson, I've always believed that Tex Watson was really, he was the force behind the family. Charlie was the head, the, the, the figurehead. He made the great little cartoon character figurehead. But Tex Watson was a very calculating man because when I met him at California Men's Colony, he was the inmate pastor in the, in the Protestant church. He had married a, a, a minister's daughter. Uh, you know, he, he had developed this yoke fellow following of people, um, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the thing was, you got to remember, he was the one that told the girls, Charlie says we've got to do this. Well, I'm sorry. You've got Charlie Manson. You've got Charles Tex Watson. Charlie. He didn't say which Charlie told him. He was another guy that was highly intelligent. And most of, the, most of the guys I knew that were serial killers were just top-notch intelligence, just not necessarily the guy you want to invite home for dinner. Right. Can you talk a little well, bit obviously. about the lead up to being released and what happened? I, I've been to nine parole hearings and I kept being denied, denied, denied. And part of their argument was that I would be deported. And they thought that, well, I would just not be able to fit in over here, so I would become a massive criminal over here. Um, 2013, I went to before a parole board and I got found suitable. And it went before the governor and the governor was Jerry Brown, who had been a governor back in the 70s. And back then he gave the prisoners bill of right and gave a lot of inmates rights that we didn't, they didn't took away later. And he said no. And uh, he didn't give me a reason. So we asked and he said, because I can. And Dang. I argued in court that because I can is not a legal, is not a legal reason, you know? I mean, that's just, that's like a mean reason. So it took me four more years to get found suitable again. They, uh, they tried to fly me home on British Airways because it'd be a nonstop, but British Airways wouldn't let me be shackled. So they brought me on Delta and I had waist chains and handcuffs on. And we went to the Sacramento airport And they uh, they threw a sweat shirt over my hands. It says, "Don't try not to look out of ordinary." I've got two guys in suits holding my arms, and my hands are like this with a sweatshirt over it. We landed in Heathrow. They had taken all the stuff, anything I had at the prison, which was over two thousand dollars. They had took from me to pay for my detention. I was given a five-pound note. Uh, walked up to the border people. Customs man comes out to me, shakes my hand, asks me how I'm doing. Told him I'm doing well. Looks at my documents. Says, how long have you been gone? I said, 64 years. He goes, why are you back? I said, I'm home. He goes, yes, you are. He goes, now just walk right down there to pick up your bags and uh, head on out. But I, yeah, I started my life over here again, you know, February 13th, 2018, with five pounds in my pocket. After 64 years, bro, they, they was trying to set you up for failure. That, that's a failure setup. And told never to come back to the U.S., but uh, quite honestly, I don't have any desire to do that. What's been the hardest thing about kind of adjusting to the whole new country? And then... Keep in mind, he didn't really do the crime that he... That, that he that, I don't know if y'all watched part one, man, but he didn't really even do the crime. So just 
back to freedom. I don't know if I'm ever going to fully be able to feel like I've, I've you know, I would have been had I grew up over here. I don't have mates over here in the, in the UK yet. I've been here coming up on five years and I've yet to actually develop the relationship where I just have some guys I can go out and shoot pool with. It's one of these things where things- It's hard, bro. Like it's hard. Like I just moved to Florida, bro, and I don't really got like I got like a couple people, but like like coming from Chicago to here and like and you're older while you're older, it's tough, man. Because you be really wanting to seclude yourself anyway when you get to this age. Like you're just trying to work on yourself, and you know you don't go out as much. But I be having to force myself to go out outside nowadays and meet people. But in Florida, man, it's like everybody just, I feel like everybody is phony. Everybody want to know you for other reasons and whatnot. Everybody want to see what they can get up out of you. You know what I'm saying? So, I don't know. As I do, I do myself. I, I go to the gym by myself. I work out by myself. Um, I've been to a few pubs where there are pool tables. I shoot pool by myself. I, I, don't, know how to, I don't know how to explain it, but I can't. I don't connect. But... Um, that's how I feel. Like, I don't really connect with the Florida people, but, no, I'm trying, man. I don't want to overexert myself, but that's a, like, I'm going to start going to the gym. So I'm pretty sure I can meet people there, man, you know, hooping. You know, when you hoop and you good, people are going to talk to you. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to, you know. Like I said, I, I, you know, I've gotten to where uh, I have a contentment and a peace about me that I wish, I wasn't sure I'd ever find. I, I, I have to say, uh-huh. My, my life is good. Um, do, I, do I not appreciate the fact I'm 68 and getting ready to turn 69? You betcha. I, I'm a dinosaur, I know I'm a dinosaur. I'm just trying to be a happy dinosaur. Land before time. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, I'm gone.